Yesterday I got up uh, kind of early so I could watch Firefly launch their sixth flight out of Vandenberg Space Force Base. This was carrying a, an experimental satellite for Lockheed Martin. And uh, I had hoped to be able to see it from my bedroom. I have line of sight, but it turns out that the sun was already just a little too bright, bright uh, and none of my footage gave me anything, which is a shame because uh, it might have been another angle on something that went wrong. You've probably heard by now that the payload did not, in fact, reach orbit. Uh, now, interestingly, by the way, Lockheed Martin, they put their satellite on Firefly because previously, because they want a dedicated launch provider. Previously, this was supposed to fly on uh, ABL Space Systems RS-1, and the only flight of that flew for 15 seconds and then fell back to the pad, and then the company gave up the idea of orbital launch and are now working on missile defense. Firefly, on the other hand, well, they are fresh off their highly successful lunar landing earlier this year. Uh, they have been, they've, they've flown, they've got their Alpha rocket. So this is the largest all carbon fiber rocket that is currently orbit capable. Obviously not quite as big as the Neutron, but that is still not flown. Uh, it's a two-stage rocket using uh, kerosene as its propellant. They use like linerless tanks. Uh, Reaver engines on the first stage, lightning engines on the second stage, and it's the second stage where uh, things start to go wrong. So initially it took off across the skies, arcing out you know, down south across the Pacific Ocean, picking up speed. And as it approaches staging, uh, what's going to have to happen is the second stage is going to have to disappear. This is a thermal camera, by the way. You can just about see the tip of the rocket here and the base of the rocket. Notice how much brighter the base is. Then we cut to this external view, and this shows the stage separation. Now, during stage separation, they have to shut down those engines and then separate the spacecraft and light the second stage engines. So here's the shutdown, and then there's a big puff of gas... The thermal camera is sort of waving around and it finally finds this, the spacecraft, the rocket, and there's some visible debris there. We cut to another camera. There's visible debris and notably, there is a very large uh, nozzle extension that is supposed to be sitting there. And also, by the way, if we cut back, I can do this. If you watch, this thing is kind of moving in a spiral motion. This second stage got a serious kick during stage separation that somehow has removed the nozzle and kicked the spacecraft into a sort of unstable state. But, you know, you can see that it is still kind of oscillating, but it does actually settle down. This is showing the payload and uh, the fairing which has now been jettisoned. Now, losing that nozzle extension, that doomed the mission. If, to get the efficiency needed to reach orbit, you want to get the maximum performance from your rocket propellant. And when you're expanding rocket uh, exhaust into a vacuum, you want to expand as much as possible because that gets the most, it accelerates the exhaust gases. So that's why you've got the main engine here, and then you would typically have a very large nozzle extension which is made of like a blade of materials usually like a type of carbon fiber with a, a phenolic resin layer on the inside something like that so that it will hold together for long enough to get it into space but anyway without that nozzle extension the engine is essentially underperforming it's throwing the same amount of fuel through the engine it's working just as hard but it's not getting the same performance out of its exhaust so if we skip forwards in time the it, and towards a second engine cutout, then what it's doing is it's picking up speed, but it's just not going as fast as it should. And by the time it reaches Seco, it should be shutting down the engine around now, except that it doesn't it actually runs the engine for a good few seconds more. It's realizing presumably that on board, like its onboard guidance is showing that it's not going as fast as it should. So it's running those tanks down until it hits some you know, sort of pre-decided threshold at which it must stop. Then it shuts down the engine. So soon after this, we get told, oh, we're going off for stage separate, or sorry, payload separation. We're going to deploy the payload into orbit. But um, then, I don't know, like 10 minutes after that, the, the official statement comes out that the spacecraft was injected into a lower than planned orbit. And then later, that gets cut <laughs> that particular statement gets cut and we get told that the spacecraft ended up landing uh, in the Pacific 
in a region north of Antarctica, which I'm going to say is somewhat redundant because the Pacific and indeed the entire planet is north of Antarctica. Regardless, it was not a great day. This is their second actual loss. Their first flight was a loss. It was, you know, uh, they lost an engine soon after takeoff. This one, they lost the nozzle extension and they just couldn't get into orbit. There's been two previous missions as well where due to guidance issues or performance issues, they were unable to insert the satellite into the target orbit. And there's been two outright successes. So I think we should actually look at the previous successes Okay, so let's rewind to flight number four, Ride the Lightning. Uh, again, we're going to watch the stage separation sequence here. This is a regular light camera uh, from Vandenberg again. You see the sort of uh, you know gas interaction there as it separates. But more importantly, on this flight, we actually get an onboard camera, which sees the spacecraft pushed out of the booster, and then the engine lights, and the booster then... You know, it looks like it falls away, but really what's happening is that second stage is accelerating away into space. Now, flight number five, that was pretty spectacular. It took place on the 4th of July, and indeed there's some great shots of 4th of July fireworks with this rocket in the background. But I want to pause this right here because this is a great view inside the interstate, and I think this is where the problem happened. Right, I, Whatever happened here, it probably happened in the interstage because that is where the mechanism is that separates the two rockets. Obviously, there's latches and stuff that have to get released to make sure that the rocket holds together. But there's also presumably some kind of separation system that will push the two rockets apart so that the second stage engine can fire. And because if, otherwise, if you started firing the engine inside here there's a pretty good chance you might damage that highly fragile nozzle. Now, if you look around the outside, there's no visible pistons or anything lining the walls here, so it's probably not a piston in the wall. It's very likely whatever mechanism is used for stage separation exists in here and maybe pushes up against this engine bell, right? Now, on the Falcon 9, there is a large piston which is driven by uh, the gas system, and that pushes the second stage clear, we don't know what is involved in this particular rocket, uh, we and we don't actually ever get to see it. I've never seen inside the second stage, uh, I've never seen anything inside here that will show me what uh, is going on. Unfortunately, we cut away in this case to the external camera, again showing the spacecraft heading out. There's the fairing separation. Everything going great and looking fantastic. This was also a twilight launch, so you see the red trail here low in the sky, as you know, because the their sunlight is redder when it's lower down, and then uh, yeah, heading out here to see the the full jellyfish getting formed in the <laughs> you know was it the rocket's red glare right? Now flight number two that does give us uh, some of the best like onboard uh, staging footage because this is like this is a, another live stream this is a clip so again you see this come out but did you see what I see there right? I saw this when I was when I began investigating what happened. I skipped right back to I saw this one. And I was like, "Wait a second. That looks kind of crazy." So again, we get this view from the inside, and again, no obvious pistons or anything around the outside. Whatever is driving the staging system has to be under here, and I think I see some bracing stuff on top of the tank. It would transfer load sideways to the walls rather than into the top of the tank. But yeah, there, you see it starts getting pushed forward. There's no engines firing at this time. And that's fine, but what really set me off was seeing just how little clearance there is between this rocket nose, this cone, the engine bell, and <laughs> the interstage. Just, just look at that. It looked like it almost hit it on the way out. And initially, when I saw this, I was like, that's what happened, right? This thing clearly flew forward, damaged the side of the nozzle, and that's why it was sort of wobbling. That's why the nozzle disintegrated when the engine lit up. And, uh, you know, that's that was the solution. I'm not convinced that that is in fact the solution. But that was my first, you know, idea because whatever happened, it had to successfully separate the second stage and the first stage, but damage the second stage in such a way that uh, the nozzle was destroyed. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, Firefly's P-1. 
payload user guide. This is for people that want to put payloads on the rocket and it contains all the details you need to put payload in the fairing, make sure it's the right size, make sure it can handle the vibration and the atmosphere, the various environment that's going to be exposed to. You can see this rocket can put one ton into low Earth orbit, 630 kilograms into uh, a sun synchronous orbit. The reason Lockheed Martin, by the way, was launching their satellite on this was because it was super secret stuff and they didn't want to do ride share and it was too big for a rocket lab, probably. And Firefly were maybe just the right price. But if we skip down here, we get this nice you know, cross section of the rocket here, right? We see hot gas stage separation in this case. Uh, what does that mean? Good question. But I'm telling you that during stage separation, we saw a fair amount of gas emitted. You see the uh, like the locks, the fuel tank up the top. The, the well, Sorry, this is the oxidizer tank up the top. This is the fuel tank down the bottom, I'm presuming. And you get to see the idea of the size of, of the various structures involved and just how big that nozzle is and the four engines down the bottom. That was probably the one thing I want to take a look at here. There are older versions of the guide. This is one from 2019. Let's see if this what this one says here. This is when they still had the beta option on their uh, future. This one here, yeah, this one says pusher mechanism stage separation in 2019. It's not saying hot gas. So I don't know what is involved in stage separation, but I highly suspect that that was involved and it didn't go right. So we have this great footage from a test firing of a stage one and two from flight number two. These are on this same test stand. So like see how the size of the stages compare to the propellant tanks next to them. Now the first stage has four reaver engines and the second stage has a single lightning engine. And you can see some thrust vectoring going on down here. Now, this is obviously second stage engine is being tested without the large nozzle extension because that would get destroyed in uh, you know, the sea level pressure. Uh, the engines on Firefly, by the way, those are the only kerosene engines that operate on the uh, tap off cycle, where instead of having a gas generator, you're pulling high pressure, high temperature combustion gases from the combustion chamber and using that to drive your turbo pumps. It simplifies some things, but it makes other things more complicated. But yeah, that, that's what the you know propulsion system on these rockets is about. OK, so this is the stage separation sequence and we've zoomed in a little. Right, so there's the engine shutting down, right? Now, the next thing we're going to see here, right, is there's this puff of gas that happens, and that is anomalous. See that? Now, if you think about it, you can see the head, you can see what looks like the full booster here, right? So it gives you an idea of how long this thing is. And then you get this big puff, which is bigger than the rocket itself. That must be 100 meters across. And it expands outwards and you very quickly see there was like a hollow shell of gas. So there's a puff of gas released for a fraction of a second. It's blown away quickly and then there's a second eruption of gas. And then out of that, we actually start to see debris. And you see debris kind of glinting. See that? So it's spinning quickly, catching the sunlight. There is a fair amount of debris that is getting kicked up very quickly. And that really doesn't feel consistent with uh, it just being the nozzle smashing into the side and then breaking when the engine lit. Now, there's this thermal camera image, and one thing to one thing to note about this is all these hot spots, these pieces of debris, are doubled up, right? And that is because this is an interlaced camera. They do the odd lines in one scan cycle and the even lines in the next scan cycle, and they combine that into a single image. And that's why you can see these little horizontal lines. So these are just in the same place. And this is just showing camera motion. And I hate interlaced video. It is a travesty that it exists in modern audio video applications, and we should be ashamed, but whatever. It's the data we have. <laughs> so I think this is, obviously this is the second stage. It's brighter. This is the thermal camera. This is the first stage. I don't think we can see very much of, I don't know if the stage, how much is left, but this is the engine section of that stage. What gets me is there's already debris that looks like it's either behind it, although it could be that it's been projected sideways and it's not quite so far behind. Um, I, I think that 
what's happened is you've got had this stage separation. There's been a fair amount of light carbon fiber debris generated. And then as soon as that engine kicked in, the exhaust train has pushed this backwards very quickly. And that's why it's behind this booster here. So this debris is probably very light uh, that it's getting pushed around very quickly. That suggests to me that it could be sides of propellant tanks. It could be portions of the interstate. It could be actually parts of the nozzle. But it's not big, heavy chunks. That's this. This is all the big, heavy stuff is here. And the booster is clearly substantially still there, but not in enough to be, uh, you know, it, it's clearly lost some weight in the process. So now from the onboard view, again, I don't know. This is the only thing that this, I think this must be the booster, right? It's already a few seconds after separation. We're catching things that sometimes catch the sunlight. There's these larger objects here. That's definitely not booster shaped. It looks like some sort of broken piece of something. It's, I mean, it, it could be a fairing. I'm wondering if the fairings were blown off by this event somehow. It's very hard to like adjust, you know, judge the timings on and how all these things fit together. Okay, so given what we know, it's fairly safe to say that something energetic happened during staging that in that process, it pushed the second stage clear, but it lost the nozzle. It may have lost the fairing in the process, and that doomed the mission. Having said that, the forces released that the second stage like experience weren't enough to destroy it outright at that time. So I'm thinking it was like a high-pressure gas system that somehow got released and maybe filled the interstage. That helped with the separation system. This is where we're sort of going into speculation. We don't know enough about how the stage separation system works on Alpha. We have very limited information. I don't think I've ever seen what it looks like, but maybe there's some photos out there. Uh, if I was to really speculate, I would say that whatever high pressure system is used, the gas leaked out, and then that maybe over pressured the interstage, causing that to blast apart, and in the process damaging the nozzle on the second stage. If I was to be even like go even a step further, just maybe, maybe the forces of separation were sufficiently high that the pusher actually damaged the oxygen bulkhead and that perhaps led to something happening. But that really is out there speculation. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that Firefly are going to have to investigate this and they're probably not going to fly for a while. It's not like they've had big launch cadence with their Alpha launch vehicle but they're going to have to convince their customers that they're okay and safe to return to flight with their, you know, 50% success rate. And I say 50% success rate saying that the two that ended up in lower orbits count as 50%, as, as half successes. I like Firefly. I want them to succeed. I want to see the uh, the MLV go because we need, you know, uh, we need a way to service the space station that isn't the Falcon 9. Of course, as of right now, Northrop Grumman, their Cygnus spacecraft, was damaged during transit, so it's not going to fly. So that might give Firefly some breathing room in their development of the, the larger booster. So obviously we want to find out what happened. Uh, we want Firefly to convince their customers that they know what happened, that then they fixed it, and then get this flying and returning to flight. Uh, it's never an easy problem to investigate these things, but I'm sure the engineers at Firefly already have better ideas than I have and should ignore everything I said as just speculation. To be clear, right? <laughs> I don't know anything special, uh, but when we do get the results, uh, I hope that we get the information uh, that I can explain it and I will be here, hopefully with an answer that makes everyone happy. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.